But anyway, hello and welcome to this joint webinar for Teachers of Politics in Schools that's being hosted by the UK Political Studies Association and the Parliamentary Education Service. Uh, my name is Dr. James Weinberg. I'm an academic at the University of Sheffield, a PSA trustee, and I'm going to be chairing this event over the next 90 minutes. Um, today's webinar, hopefully you already know this, but it's going to focus on one aspect of the A-level politics curriculum, uh, the House of Lords. And specifically, we're asking two key questions. So how does the House of Lords hold governments to account? And what, if any, is the case for or against reforming the House of Lords? And to impart their expert wisdom and to answer your questions, uh, no doubt as both teachers and interested citizens, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Meg Russell uh, and the Lord Speaker, the Right Honourable uh, Lord MacPhail. So each of our speakers is going to give a short presentation of roughly 15 minutes or so uh, before opening up to take your uh, questions as an audience. And if you'd like to ask a question, please post it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, or I think it says uh, chat, not Q&A. Uh, and I'll do my best to pick up on as many of your questions as possible. In between each speaker, we're going to take a short screen break of just five minutes so that everyone has a chance to refresh and step away from their computer before recommencing. Uh, no doubt you're already feeling quite tired after a long teaching day, so we really appreciate you sticking with us and giving us your attention, and hopefully you'll find the next 90 minutes um, rewarding and enriching. So let's crack on then. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, the Right Honourable Lord MacPhail. Lord MacPhail's parliamentary career started as the elected Labour and Cooperative MP for Dumbarton, a seat which he held from 1987 to 2010. And amongst other positions, Lord MacPhail spent time as a whip, a junior minister and chair of the Treasury Select Committee. He entered the House of Lords as a life peer in 2010 and was elected as Lord Speaker in April of this year. So I'm delighted to hand over now to the Right Honourable Lord MacPhail. Uh, good afternoon, James. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm <coughs> delighted to be joining you, albeit remotely on that. And I would like to start by thanking the Political Studies Association and my own House of Lords Education and Gain Engagement Service for arranging the event. Before I became an MP, I had a lifetime in education. I was a chemistry teacher and then I became a deputy head teacher uh, for 13 years. So I can appreciate the benefits of seminars such as these. Also, in my previous post in the House of Lords, the Senior Deputy Speaker, uh, which I held for five years, Every Thursday morning, I addressed uh, uh, different schools, and I think I probably got to over 2,000 uh, students in that. And it proved to me that whilst students and the general public can be less interested in party politics, they're most certainly interested in politics itself. So it's very much alive uh, to that. And I'm also delighted that Meg Russell is here, because uh, Meg's an expert on the House of Lords, and parliamentary policy and she's engaged with us uh, informally and formally, particularly given evidence to our committees. The role of Lord Speaker, uh, let me just explain that role and its history. <clears throat> Until 2006, the Lord Chancellor was the Speaker of the Lords, as well as a senior member of the Cabinet and head of the judiciary in England and Wales. But Tony Blair's government changed that and as a result the Constitutional Reform Act which was passed in 2005 separated the role of Lord Speaker and Lord Chancellor. The Lord Chancellor remains the head of the judiciary and a senior cabinet member but is now a member of the House of Commons and Robert Buckland uh, occupies that position uh, just now. So the post of Lord Speaker in the House of Lords was created to preside over the deliberations in the chamber principally. Uh, and the House of Commons is chaired by Mr. Speaker, but there's a great difference between the two of them. The Speaker in the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, is charged with keeping order in the House of Commons, but thankfully, as Lord Speaker, I don't have that responsibility because the House of Lords is referred to as a self-regulating house. Uh, in other words, it has a much calmer uh, approach and the role of the Lord Speaker is there to assist rather than to rule. 
And it's the job of the House itself to rule and procedure or call members to order. I mentioned that I was senior deputy speaker for five years, and in that post, I was chairman of all the committees, the liaison committee, the procedure committee, the privileges committee, the selection uh, of members committee, you name it, whatever. Uh, but it's these committees comprising members of the House that do the policy business in the House. Most days, uh, that works in terms of the House uh, itself, ruling itself, although we still have the position, for example, at the beginning of oral questions, when two or more peers can stand up and it's a battle of wills to see who's going to stand up the longest uh, to get their question. We could be doing things better. Uh, that's certainly my point of view in that. But as Lord Speaker, my role is completely impartial. When I took up the role on the 1st of May, I resigned my party affiliation and I've been a member of the Labour Party or well on near enough 50 years on that. So I resigned that party affiliation and therefore in this position, I cannot enter into any debate on any party political issues. And the reason for that is that I represent all members of the House of Lords, regardless of party. I am the fourth Lord Speaker, following in the footsteps of Baroness Heyman, the first one, Baroness D'Souza, and most recently, Lord Fowler. Uh, in fact, when I was elected, my first day in the job was on the 1st of May, and uh, the duty I had was to welcome the Queen uh, to the state opening of Parliament. So there's not many people get a first day like that, welcoming the Queen. So everything's downhill from there. <laughs> uh, what I do is I open the house every day. There's a Lord Speaker's procession and then there's oral questions. I mean, today, for example, uh, I opened the house at uh, 12 o'clock and I was on the rule sack for one hour uh, where the oral questions were taking place. And they cover quite a vast range of topics and they can be quite lively. Uh, one innovation that the house has engaged in over the past year or so is to establish what they call private notice questions. And that gives members of the House the opportunity to scrutinise the government on any uh, matter or issue of the day. Uh, and every day I get, or near enough every day, I get applications for private notice questions. And along with my staff, I've got to decide if they're relevant. In other words, are they urgent? Uh, that uh, there is a pressing element to that and are they within the rules of the House itself? Uh, to date, and as I mentioned, I've taken up since the 1st of May, I've granted nine private notice questions on areas, for example, official development assistance, a 0.7 uh, uh, target for overseas budgets, uh, to the COVID-19 education recovery plan. And that was quite a lively event, that, that one. So, What's the main area and work of the House of Lords? Well, really, it's about scrutiny uh, and how the House of Lords hold the government to account. So our primary role is to check on legislation. We are a revising chamber and we check bills that come from the Commons. And I have to say, as a former member of the House of Commons for 23 years, and as one who was engaged in many committees upstairs in the House of Commons looking at bills. We do not scrutinise bills in the House of Commons to the same extent as they do in the House of Lords. There is a procedure which has now been introduced into the House of Commons, uh, known as the guillotine procedure. It was done under the Labour government in the early 2000s. And that time limits the scrutiny time that the House of Commons uh, can look at legislation. And largely speaking, what has resulted in is incomplete uh, uh, scrutiny. But when it comes to the House of Lords, the House of Lords doesn't have any time limit on its scrutiny. So it can take whatever time it wants to scrutinise legislation. And the way I explain it to younger pupils uh, when I'm talking to them is that the House of Commons sends legislation to us along here with a dirty face and what we do is we clean the face and we send it back to them. Now, it's up to them to decide whether they accept that. If they don't accept it, 
they'll send it back to us. Uh, if we feel quite strongly about it, we'll buff it up again, clean it and send it back to them. And in extreme t cases, we'll do it a third time. But the House of Lords is position is secondary to the House of Commons. The House of Commons is the sovereign body. So really what we say after the second or third time, if that happens is, well, look, you've had your chance. We've given you our best advice. So be it, let it be in your head if this is, in our opinion, incomplete uh, legislation as a result of that. And in an average year, I think um, we could be talking about, uh, say, some of the over 1,300 amendments which are scrutinised by the House of Lords and sent back uh, to the House, House of Commons. And over 90% of them, maybe about 95%, have been accepted. So when they come to the House of Lords, engagement takes place at that stage. There's a first reading, there's a second reading, there's committee stages. And through that process, we can put our amendments to the House of Commons. So the House of Lords definitely does a real scrutiny job uh, and uh, I'm sure that that will be reinforced uh, by others when you're speaking to them. The membership of the House though has some of the most able and talented people in the land from all walks of life raising the level of national debate. For example, doctors and nurses who know the NHS in intimately, university lecturers, professors, school teachers who spent a lifetime in education, former defence chiefs, foreign office officials, uh, ethicists, philosophers, you name it. So they're in there and they scrutinise the legislation, but they're also members of our committees. And the committees in the House of Commons do an excellent job. Uh, my comments as senior deputy speaker to committee members is that, look, we must ensure that we enhance the work of our committees because uh, the information we've got is very good. But largely speaking, uh, we have these good reports, they go to the floor of the House and then nothing very much happens to them thereafter. And what I was doing as Senior Deputy Speaker when I established the review of committees was to say we must have a communication uh, plan and a communication strategy for ensuring that we get the message out to policymakers, to uh, institutes, to educational establishment, what we're doing. And I have ambitions that we could send a six monthly uh, review document out to all schools to tell them exactly what we're doing in the house itself. And I know from the conversations I've had with staff members and others that they would welcome that. So what the House of Lords has to do, in my opinion, is it's got to challenge the caricature of the, of the House of Lords. You know, it's uh, unelected, it doesn't do very much, it should be abolished tomorrow. We can have these debates on it, but for me as Lord Speaker, it's about an effective second chamber and how we go about our business. And I'm quite happy to engage with people in that particular debate about uh, what we're doing uh, as to the future. So getting that legislation through is, is very important. And I'll give you an example of very recent uh, legislation. For example, the UK Internal Market Act, which passed through Parliament at the end of last year. As Senior Deputy Speaker, I convened politicians from the different uh, devolved entities from Scotland, from Wales, uh, from Northern Ireland, although the Assembly in Northern Ireland was down at that particular time. But we looked at Brexit, and we looked at the internal market, and it was the first time that politicians from uh, different parts of the country got together to look at these particular issues. And it is a good innovation, and members from Scotland, England, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, they were quite keen on that. And it's one of my ambitions as Lord Speaker to regenerate that, that interest so that we, in reaching out, are reaching our crowds out all over the United Kingdom and not just to the Southeast and to the London area. And as a Scot, and someone who's represented a Scottish constituency for 20 years, 
who's lived in that area and still lives in that area, uh, I think it's very important that we do reach out. And this is a particularly sensitive time constitutionally, particularly with Scotland, which has been described as one foot out of the, the, the door at this particular moment. Uh, so uh, that soft power of the House of Lords is, uh, in my opinion, very uh, important. Now, should the House of Lords be an elected chamber or, uh, or whatever? An elected House sounds appealing, but for me, one of the issues that we need to look at uh, is the issue of the status if it's elected. If it has a status equal to the House of Commons, then certainly if I was a member of the House of Lords, then I would feel my worth the same as a member of the House of Commons. For example, at the moment, the House of Lords does not scrutinise financial legislation, does not scrutinise any budgets. Well, certainly, if one is going to elect members in the House of Lords, then I think they should do that, because if they're going to elect it, they'll be at town halls, they'll be in community centres, they'll be engaging with constituents, and they'll be asking them for improvements, whether it's in education, transport, health, whatever else it is. So that, that will take place, uh, and therefore there's real issues to be looked at at the moment uh, if it's going to be an elected House of Lords. But that's for the future. My role as Lord Speaker is to ensure that we can get across the message that it's an effective second chamber. That's my ambitions for the moment, but I'm very much aware of the sensitive environment that we're in constitutionally and politically in the country. So we'll leave it at that and pass over to people for their comments. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, uh, Lord McFarl. That's um, some really uh, fascinating points there and great to get your personal opinion on these questions that we're tackling today as well. <laughs> We've had a couple of um, questions posed by audience members in the chat. Um, please, if you haven't already, get your questions in there for, for Lord McFarl. Um, and we'll, we'll take the first one from Paul Taggart. Uh, and Paul asks, Lord Speaker, um, there's been an increased number of ex-MPs and ministers in the Lords, especially since 2010. Whilst this can clearly bring a wealth of experience of government, can you comment on how much benefit this has provided the House of Lords, as well as potentially any drawbacks, i.e. is the Lords becoming too politicised? Well, I don't think it's becoming too politi politicised. Let me just give you, from my own point of view, it's for 10 years until I retired from the House of Commons, I was chair of the Treasury Committee, and in the Prime Minister's resignation list, Gordon Brown asked if I would go into the House of Lords as a working peer, because my focus was on economics and finance. Uh, I, when I came into the House, I was put on the Economic Affairs Committee uh, right at the very beginning. And along with individual like, for example, Lord Forsyth, who, him and I being, if you like, political opponents in Scotland, we were looking at issues in the Economic Affairs Committee like the, the Scottish referendum and the implications for economic cooperation and, and financial engagement and the position of the Bank of England and whatever else. And we produced a report after taking evidence in Scotland, which in many ways helped inform the themes of the debate in the referendum in Scotland. Now, we did not take a party political position, but we laid out the issues for debate on that issue. And therefore, I felt that as an ex-MP, as Michael Forsyth, an ex-MP, we were doing a job not as, if you like, aggressively as one would do as a member of parliament. So that element is important. And then the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, established the Parliamentary Commission for Banking Standards, which comprised members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. It was chaired by my successor in the Treasury Committee, Andrew Tyree, but uh, Nigel Lawson, former Chancellor of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was a former finance director himself, uh, Lord Turnbull, former Cabinet Secretary, and myself, went on from the House of Lords. And what happened there was really interesting because we had a set of proposals which the government said they would accept. Andrew Tyree contacted us eventually after we put a report and said, look, 
the government aren't accepting all the points that we have made. So over to yourselves in the House of Lords to effect those changes and those amendments. And as I mentioned earlier, given there's no time limit on our scrutiny, we eventually got those amendments through. And that was a good example of the House of Lords, the House of Commons working together, but the House of Lords knowing its place in that the House of Commons is a sovereign body. Brilliant, thank you very much. We've got two more questions that go together quite nicely, both about uh, appointments to the House of Lords. So the first is from Nick Yates, who's um, asking simply, is there a limit on the number of life peers that opposition parties can propose or nominate? And can anyone veto their nominations? And the related question from Trace, uh, who asks, Lord Speaker, what are your thoughts on the number of peers within the chamber at present? Is it too big to be effective? Right. Good. In terms of the number of peers, yeah, we, we do have uh, too many peers. Absolutely. And my predecessor, Lord Fowler, established a committee under Lord Burns, Terry Burns, former permanent secretary of the Treasury, uh, comprising members of the House of Lords, to look at the size of the House. And they came out with the recommendations that we want a House no bigger than the size of the House of Commons. So something like 600 over 10 years. Uh, and by the way, that was put to the House as a motion and it was accepted by the whole House. So yes, it's far too big uh, on that. But uh, what's happened is that there have been a, quite a number of members been put in in the past year and the formula which we were observing, which was two members retiring or leaving the House for every member coming in over the 10 year period to get to 600, that was disrupted as a result of that. So when I stood for Lord Speaker, uh, part of my hustings and manifesto debate was that I want to have a discussion with the Prime Minister uh, about the Burns report and take it forward. And indeed, in the House of Commons environs a month or so back, uh, I passed Boris Johnson when he was talking to fellow MPs and he singled me out to wish me all the best. And I said, well, look, that's good, but I'm going to come to see you. So I've got an appointment in Down Street on that very point on it. The second thing is the uh, members of the House, it's not for individual parties to nominate it. The Down Street and the Prime Minister of the day, they hold all the cards here. And when Theresa May was Prime Minister, she had a good relationship uh, with the Lord Speaker and she didn't put uh, many people in in the House itself because she was aware of the Burns report and what our demands were on that. So we've got to try to get that on board again and that's one of my tasks, difficult though that it may, may be. Uh, the other thing is the House of Lords Appointments Commission. Uh, I want to engage with the House of Lords Appointments Commission because I want the House of Lords Appointments Commission not to be controlled from the Cabinet Office, but to be on a statutory basis and to be in the ownership of the House of Lords itself. Lord Bew is the chairman of that, that committee, does a good job, but I think that they're hampered by their limited uh, uh, responsibilities, their limited uh, tasks that they can undertake. And I want to engage in that debate as well. And when I go to down the street, I will be raising that issue with the Prime Minister as well. Brilliant. Okay. We've got um, two more questions here that are, uh, again, both related. So the first from Miss Smith and the second from um, Andrew Hanna, both of who are, in essence, asking whether the continued presence of 92 hereditary peers can still be justified. Uh, well, if we go way back to 1998, I think it was, when the Labour government were in power, and maybe Meg uh, has got a more precise understanding of this than I have. So Meg, when I depart here, you can uh, correct me, you know, robustly or refine, <laughs> okay. But in 1998, uh, Tony Blair came to an agreement whereby 600 hereditary peers were or so were uh, rejected, if you like, put out the House of Lords uh, on that. And the agreement it came to was that for a temporary period, there would be 92 peers uh, there 
but they would go when primary legislation came forward at a later date. That primary legislation didn't come forward, and therefore that's a legacy from 1998. And I was asked this when I was standing for the uh, Lord Speaker, and actually I valued the work of quite a number of hereditary peers here who have experience, say, in uh, finance, legal affairs, uh, the corporate world, uh, diplomacy, whatever else it is. And I would like to ensure that the, the hereditary, peers, peer, hereditary peers element is looked at as we reduce the size of the house itself. And I think it's important. But in the interim, one of my colleagues, Bruce Grocott, uh, an inveterate campaigner on hereditary peers by-election, uh, is wanting these absurd by-elections to be abolished. And I did say uh, in my campaign for Lord Speaker that I supported him uh, in that. And I'd like to see those by-elections because I don't think it, it helps uh, the reputation of the House. So, in essence, what I'm saying is the House of Lords should be looked at holistically rather than just targeting one session, one section, sorry. Fantastic. And we've got time for, for one more question in this section. So um, we're going to take one from Alistair Endersby, um, who's asked a question that I think is probably equally pertinent for Meg as well. Um, so we can come back to it in the next session. But Alistair asks, he says, I I'm interested in the impact of House of Lords defeats on legislation. I think previous Constitution Unit work found that about 60% of House of Lords defeats were overturned in ping pong as the government exerted its Commons majority. Is there any recent work on whether that figure still holds? And maybe uh, the question to you, Lord McFall, is um, whether you think the House of Lords is having a significant or meaningful impact, uh, or House of Lords defeat, sorry, uh, having a significant impact on the legislation at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The House of Lords has a, a really considerable impact in terms of amending legislation. There's no really doubt about that. But what I say to people is, the House of Commons is the elected chamber. The House of Commons is unelected uh, on that, albeit a range of expertise and whatever else. So constitutionally, we have to know our place. That's really, really important. And that's why I said to you about sending amendments back once, twice, or maybe three times. But at the end of the day, the House of Commons is sovereign and that has to get its rightful place there. But I wouldn't concern myself with uh, the House of Lords sending amendments back to the House of Commons itself, because that's our purpose. We are here for that scrutiny, and that scrutiny will make better legislation, will make better law, and that's important. And from my time in the House of Commons, I well remember the Mad Dogs Act. If you remember, that was passed very quickly. What an act that was. It should have been the Mad MPs Act <laughs> as a result of it. So that was bad law. And we're trying to prevent bad law and make good law. That's the essence of the House of Lords. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lord McFall. Uh, we're only running five minutes behind, so I'm going to leave it there uh, and say thank you for joining us. Thank you for your uh, your talk and, and for answering all the questions uh, on behalf of, of our audience. Can I just say, and one of my aims is reaching out to, uh, to society is very important, but people of Meg Russell who uh, engaged and understood the House of Lords are really helpful to us uh, as we go about our business. So that engagement element is really important for us and I want to do even more of that. But Meg's done a tremendous job in the past for us and her and I have a, a few discussions. You're very kind, thank you. <laughs> well, luckily we're going to be hearing from, from Meg in just a few minutes, but I promised that I'd give everyone five minutes to step away from their screen. So uh, we're at 16.35 now, so if we reconvene at 16.40, then we'll get started with uh, the, the next session uh, and Professor Meg Russell's talk then. Um, feel free to just turn your cameras off and, and step away um, and we'll see you shortly. All right, well, let's get going again then. Um, hopefully you all had a chance there to, to stretch your legs and, and get a cup of tea or a glass of water. Um, so we're moving on to the second uh, of our two speakers today, um, Meg Russell. Uh, Meg is a professor of British and comparative politics at UCL and director of the Constitution Unit. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Russell's particularly well known for her research on the British House of Lords, our topic today, bicameralism, parliamentary policy influence. And before joining UCL, uh, Meg worked in the House of Commons and for the British Labour Party. And in 1999, she was actually a consultant to the Royal Commission on Reform of the House of Lords. Um, she's also acted as an advisor to a number of parliamentary committees, including the House of Lords Appointments Commission and the Lord Speaker's Committee on the Size of the House. Uh, and we are delighted today that she's here to, to share her wisdom with all of us. So over to you, um, Professor Meg Russell. Thank you very much, James, and thank you also to the Political Studies Association and the Parliamentary Education Service for inviting me to join this uh, seminar, and I'm sorry about my strange lighting. I'm going to share some slides with you, um, so let me just click share screen. There we go. Um, and turn the slideshow on. Can everybody see that? Is that okay? James, thumbs up? Yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, so I'm sticking to the topics as presented at the start, and I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour on both. Uh, there's lots to say. Um, the structure of what I'm going to say, I'll start with the basic question, what is the House of Lords and what distinguishes it from the House of Commons? Say a bit about what existing research shows us about its scrutiny function, then reflect a bit on what might have changed, and then move on to the topic of reform. What are the options, what are the prospects, and what does the future hold? So in terms of what the House of Lords is, um, if any of you thinks that this is the answer, please stop immediately showing pictures like this to your students. Um, yes, these people are sitting in the House of Lords, uh, and yes, they are members of the House of Lords, but this thing happens once a year, and the clue is that person there. Uh, this is the Queen's speech. Um, most days of the year, uh, they don't dress up in silly clothes. They actually look rather normal. Uh, except perhaps for the Lord Speaker and the clerks who have a bit of a uniform. But um, those pictures do the House of Lords a disservice and they're getting driven out increasingly from the newspapers. Um, but let's not perpetuate that image of the Lords being this kind of strange place full of uh, the aristocracy who wear funny clothes. Um, in terms of um, key differences to the Commons, um, I suppose I'm, I'm sort of trying to challenge a few myths here, and this is uh, these are things that I put to my students at uh, undergraduate and postgraduate level. I start by asking them what the key differences between the chambers are, and in terms of composition, um, the answer that you almost inevitably get back is, well, the House of Lords isn't elected and the House of Commons is elected. Well, obviously that's true. The chamber comprises mostly life peers plus hereditaries and Church of England bishops. You might also get, well, it's an expert chamber, and, and Lord McFall mentioned this, um, and that is also to an extent true, although it is disputed um, and difficult to measure. The thing that I would point to um, more than anything is the fact that it is a chamber where the government doesn't have a majority, and the government does usually, obviously not always, but usually have a majority in the House of Commons. The House of Lords is a kind of no overall control chamber, where the balance of power sometimes is actually held by a large group of independent members and that's crucial to understanding the place. In terms of powers, most people would say well the House of Lords can only delay legislation and particularly uh, on financial legislation it has very little power and again I would say yes but that is important but the key difference is that the House of Commons can remove the government from office via a no confidence vote and the House of Lords cannot. And that is so fundamental that people tend to forget that, of course, it is true and it changes the dynamic again. So in terms of um, scrutiny and these sort of dynamics, what does existing research tell us? Well, this is my book on the House of Lords that I have to plug, uh, published by Oxford University Press. But I would emphasize in 2013, eight years ago. So that's why I'm saying, what do we know now and what do we actually not know? What's been happening since? And I'll move on to that. But what we do know in terms of consequences of the compositional and power differences between the two chambers is that in some ways the House of Lords is a less challenging chamber than the, than, than the Commons for government. So it can't bring the government down via a no confidence vote. Um, and of course, as Lord McFall emphasised, members of the Lords respect the primacy of the elected Commons. In most disputes, they will ultimately back down. Um, 
Debate in the chamber um, due to its makeup tends to be less partisan and more reasoned. This is because the government is not assured of a majority. It has to convince people to support its policy. And there's a lot of experts in there. Um, the focus of attention, particularly on legislation, but also through committees um, and questions, is often on the detail of policy rather, on, rather than on the sort of big picture not on the big political dividing lines, but on the implementation of policy. So in some ways, I would suggest the House of Lords is actually a more challenging environment for ministers than the House of Commons. They need to win the argument in there. They can't just get by by sloganizing and depending on their majority. And they face a very diverse and expert audience in question time, in legislation and via the House of Lords committees. And for the ministers themselves, ministers in the Lords tend to hold much wider briefs than ministers in the House of Commons. So they have a particularly challenging time. Um, I could speak about committees and questions, but we're on such limited time, I'm mostly just going to speak about legislation, but do ask me questions about the other things. Um, this follows from um, what I've already said. And Lord McFall actually has, re has referred to some of this. The, the, the Lords makes thousands of amendments per year to legislation. The year that I've got here is slightly uh, out of date. 2008, nine, 6,000 amendments proposed, 1,800 of them agreed to in the Lords. But he said most of these are accepted. This is true. Most of them actually originate from the government. So the vast majority of those 1,800 amendments were proposed in the name of ministers. So that makes it look, uh, well, the House of Lords not actually exerting that much power. But I would say again, our research, which has tracked lots of amendments, uh, that four and a half thousand amendments or something we tracked, um, most of the government amendments that have any serious substance are actually a response to points raised in Parliament. Um, so the pressure on issues often begins in the Commons and moves over to the Lords. And sometimes in the Commons, the minister will say, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to change policy now. We need time to think about this. And they will return to an issue in the Lords. And that's really an important theme as well. The links between the chambers. Somebody actually asked about uh, defeats. Alistair asked about defeats and we've researched this, too. Um, Another important difference, this relates to the detail versus the big picture, is that the House of Lords doesn't normally vote on the big principles of the bill. It doesn't vote on the second reading or the third reading as a whole of bills. It votes on detailed amendments. When it does vote um, on amendments, it's quite frequent that the government gets defeated. Um, here's some data. Uh, so the last session, which has just finished 2019, 2021, you've got 114 defeats in the House of Lords during that session. Admittedly, it's a long session. I would point out here, look, there's a difference between the Labour years in the 1970s, then a long period of the Conservative years, and then Labour coming back into power again because of the balance in the Lords as it was then. It was a very Conservative dominated institution. But actually, more recently, since the reform in 1999 that made it no overall control, Conservative governments are getting defeated uh, as well. And look here, since 2015, the number of defeats has been significantly higher. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that. Um, a big question is whether government defeats matter. And Alistair mentioned this. This was our research. Um, we know that on most bills, uh, at least those that start in the House of Commons, amendments coming from the Lords can be overturned in the Commons. So you might expect that the government in the Commons would simply use its majority to overturn all House of Lords defeats. But we traced hundreds of Lords defeats uh, from the period 1999 to 2012. And we found that that doesn't actually always happen. Just under half of House of Lords defeats what we call stick. They, they find their way into the final version of the legislation. Why would that be? Um, well, the House of Lords watches what happens in the House of Commons very closely. The same is not quite so true in reverse. The Commons tends not to pay much attention to the Lords. Uh, but the Lords watches the Commons carefully. And if there are issues there that there is difficulty on, that the government's in difficulty on, particularly with its own backbenchers, the House of Lords will take advantage of that. And there's actually a lot of communication between the chambers. Members in the Commons who feel something's unresolved will try and team up with people in the Lords to get them on board uh, for a change and ensure that there's a sort of follow through from one chamber to the other. 
Um, we found in our analysis that if you're asking which defeats get accepted by the government, there's, a, there's quite a close relationship between whether there's been dissent expressed on the government benches on that issue. So you can actually visibly see that, but you also talk to people and, and you just know it's true. You know they work together. So this comes back to that point. I think it's really important to see the two chambers of parliament, not as separate bodies that have, live in separate worlds, but actually as an interconnected system. They talk to each other all the time and the House of Lords often is in some ways doing the House of Commons business. Um, coming on to what we don't know. Um, my book was published, as I said, uh, eight years ago now. Uh, there's been very little study of the House of Lords, essentially in the Conservative years, uh, particularly since 2012, because we dealt with the first long session of the coalition government. This move to a House of Lords which, which can beat the Conservatives has been quite a difficult transition for the Conservatives in particular, for Labour to some extent, because the, the Labour can potentially win in the House of Lords for the first time if they get enough uh, Liberal Democrats and crossbenchers on board. It's been a difficult adjustment, I would suggest, for Conservative commentators as well. It sort of turned people's expectations on their heads somewhat. This didn't hit so much in the coalition years uh, because actually when you added the Liberal Democrat peers to the Conservative peers, they were pretty strong in the Lords. They were stronger than Labour had been. But once you get to 2015, uh, the Conservatives are at a significant disadvantage in the chamber. One of the things that happened straight away, some of you might remember this, there was this, uh, this sort of showdown between George Osborne as uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer and the House of Lords on tax credits, where they were trying rather technical to push through quite a major change that would deny people tax credits using secondary legislation. Um, without very much scrutiny. And the House of Lords said, no, you're, this, you're going too far. This needs more scrutiny. They threw it out. Um, interestingly, Osborne didn't take it back to the House of Commons because the Lords was doing exactly that thing that I said. They were picking up on a thing where they knew there was a lot of discontent on the Conservative benches in the Commons. So Osborne said that your behaviour is completely outrageous. You're out of order. We should slash your powers. You know, this is terrible. But actually, he didn't dare put it back to MPs because he knew it was likely to be defeated in the Commons once, uh, once uh, the Lords had pointed out the problem. You then, of course, had uh, Brexit uh, in, uh, coming along quickly after 2015. And you begin to see headlines like this in the, uh, the right-leaning papers in particular. So this is actually, I would say, essentially untrue. <laughs> The House of Lords caused very little difficulty over Brexit, but it was painted as a very Remain dominated chamber. Both chambers were in difficulty because they had a referendum hanging over them. It wasn't only the House of Lords that didn't feel able to question the referendum result. It was actually the House of Commons where people were going through lots of agony. And the House of Lords didn't really have to get involved very much in this because the Commons were, well, the Commons became a hung Commons. Um, and there was enough controversy down there. But we've seen lots of negative stories about the Lords um, in the right wing newspapers since the Conservatives have come back to power, which is interesting. So there's a sort of a bit of a, a mood on the Conservative side of politics as a whole that the House of Lords is a problem, which used to be the reverse. It used to be Labour that thought that. Um, uh, Alistair specifically asked, do government defeats matter now in the same way they did before? And actually, I would say we don't know the answer to that question. So in the recent, most recent session, I said well, there were 114 defeats, the highest in any session since the mid-1970s, although it was a long session. Um, quite extraordinary was the regret motion at second reading of the U UK Internal Market Bill. Some of you will, many of you will know that that's the thing where uh, the government was accused of being in breach of international law. It was hugely controversial. You had former Conservative leaders and former Conservative Prime Ministers, including Theresa May, speaking out on this. Um, and the Lords did a thing that it really doesn't do in normal circumstances at all. It defeated the government at second reading, but only on a motion rather than blocking the bill itself. It then amended the bill very heavily at the subsequent stages 15 times. Um, there have been a number of other high profile interventions. So there was a ping pong on the uh, genocide in the trade bill, whether we do trade with countries that are accused of genocide and on maintaining food standards post Brexit um, in international trade. Many of these just anecdotally didn't stick. 
notwithstanding the fact that there was a lot of concern on the Conservative benches in, in the Commons as well as the Lords on these very issues. So we don't really know whether the Lords is making the impact that it used to do, but Boris Johnson's government is very resistant to, well, scrutiny. Uh, it doesn't like interference. Um, and he wants to use his majority in the Commons um, to push these kind of problems away. It's a bit of a dangerous tactic to my mind because he's asking to backbenchers in the Commons to vote for things they don't want to vote for. And I think it could be storing up trouble. But at the moment, the House of Lords anecdotally doesn't look like it's having the same impact. What else is going on there? Um, we, I've talked about the change media attitudes to the Lords. This is in part, but not entirely connected to the excessive appointments that we've seen in recent years. David Cameron um, appointed a huge number of people to the Lords. Boris Johnson um, has uh, done something similar in his short period. Not just large numbers, but actually very strongly tilted to the Conservatives because they want to get control of the chamber back. They don't like the fact that they're getting defeated in there. Here's a graph on the size of the House of Lords since reform in 1999. Um, it was at 666. It's now up over 800. Um, and this is actually an old graph. That's not the latest figure. Um, Boris Johnson made some more appointments in December, so it's now even bigger. Um, this leads to headlines about the bloated House of Lords. Um, and the, the Express has lots of negative headlines about the Lords on all sorts of things. This story was really interesting uh, in the Times following the last set of appointments. It not only draws attention to size, but also begins to question the quality of the, the appointees, which is a really, really tricky issue, not measurable, clearly, very much subject to uh, opinion. Um, but based on conversations with quite a number of people in and outside the Lords, they suggest something which actually I suggested years ago under David Cameron, that the government can discredit the House of Lords by over appointing to it and by putting people in there that people might find controversial, that people might judge unworthy. And it can generate these negative headlines about the Lords, which then, of course, strengthen it against the Lords if they make it look ridiculous. Uh, the ridicule is why I don't want you to uh, look, show pictures of people wearing robes. So moving very quickly to reform, I'm, I'm running out, very much running out of time. Um, there are lots of different options for reform, which you'll be familiar with, I'm sure. This idea of a chamber of the nations and regions, uh, which Labour is particularly attached to. This is unfortunately not much more than a slogan. Nobody's really worked out how to do it. It's kind of a good idea in principle, but implementing it is very tricky in practice. Um, a largely a wholly elected chamber, we've had lots of discussion about that. Both Labour uh, and the coalition government attempted this. The House of Commons doesn't really want it because it strengthens the Lords against itself. All the parties are split. And there are principled arguments on both sides, which John McFall was starting to articulate. Abolition is clearly one option, not really on the agenda and not very sensible in a big and diverse democracy like ours. And then there are smaller changes to the current system. These are definitely needed, but remarkably difficult in practice. Um, these topics are taken from a blog post that I wrote on the Constitution Unit blog, which you can um, click through to and read more of the detail if you like. Um, there is a central conundrum in bicameralism, because I study uh, parliaments comparatively, as well as just the UK. The whole point of a second chamber is to challenge the decisions of the first elected chamber. Um, whether the second chamber is elected or appointed, it's going to be controversial. Uh, second chambers have been referred to as essentially contested institutions. So there are challenges against the legitimacy of check and chambers all around the world um, in countries where they're elected by the people, where they're indirectly elected by regional assemblies, where they're appointed, where they're mixed. The key point here is the House of Lords is not alone. It's not just because it's this weird kind of formally hereditary appointed place that people attack it. Second chambers are subject to attack and it would remain so even if it were elected. Historically, the precedents for reform are that small scale reforms succeed sometimes. So this is a series of uh, acts of parliament. The Parliament Act 1911 removed the Lord's veto. In 1949, the delay power was shortened to a year. In 1958, life peerages were introduced for the first time. In 1999, most of the hereditary peers were removed. And in 2014, through a private member's bill, 
uh, the ability to retire was introduced. Each of these policies at the time was considered long overdue and inadequate as, in terms of a reform. But actually, if you look at them incrementally, they have fundamentally changed the House of Lords over the space of a century or so. Um, in contrast, large scale reforms always fail. In 2011, famously, there was promised a second stage of reform to, um, uh, to introduce election. In 1968, Harold Wilson tried a large scale reform and totally failed. He couldn't get his bill through. Um, as Lord McFall said, after 1999, there was supposed to be a second stage by Labour. That never happened. Lots of proposals, each of them withdrawn one by one. And then in 2012, the coalition government tried to introduce a largely elected Lords and its bill failed at the first hurdle. So if we're looking for a small, and James, I promise I'm finishing. <laughs> if, we, if we're looking for a small change that's top of the agenda now, it is the one that we've already heard about if we're looking for the next incremental thing. And Lord McFall actually articulated this pretty well. Uh, so his predecessor as Lord Speaker established this committee, which reported in 2017, and proposed that there should be a cap on the size of the House and that um, there should be limits on appointments, by the, on the Prime Minister's appointments, so that only one uh, new peer is created for each two that leave until you get to the 600 cap. Um, uh, the key House of Commons committee on this accepted the principles um, from uh, the, this, this committee and Theresa May kind of didn't dispute them and kind of went along with them. She never embraced them. But this committee reported last month on progress. It reports periodically and its comment on Boris Johnson was that he has undone much of the progress made in the last few years by the House and the previous Prime Minister. So where are we? This is my last slide. Lord's reform is difficult to achieve. Indeed, second chamber reform in general is difficult. In practice in the UK, we need government legislation for a large scale, any, any serious reform really. But governments tend to be split. They have other priorities and they even have disincentives from making the House of Lords better. Meanwhile, outside groups, much to my frustration, tend to rally around large scale reforms, which are likely never gonna happen. And they don't really rally around the small scale reforms. And whilst we have that situation, there is actually a danger that the House of Lords could face a slow kind of destruction um, through being made to look more and more big and ridiculous and unbalanced, whether intentional or unintentional. And that, I suggest, would be bad for the whole of Parliament, not just for the House of Lords and bad for executive accountability. And there I end. And sorry for talking for a bit long. <laughs> I'll stop sharing. Thank you ever so much, Meg. That was a, a real tour de force in, in, in only 15 minutes or so. So that, that really, really appreciate that. I'm sure everyone on the call does too. Um, we've got a couple of questions and I can uh, also ask you a, a couple of my own as well while we're waiting for others to come in. Um, but the first comes from Marcella, who asks whether you could give some examples of cooperation between backbenchers and the Lords in recent years. In recent years? Well, I mean, I would say... Uh, presumably she means between the Commons and the Lords. And I think that those, those things that I mentioned, there has been cooperation. This is why I say that Boris Johnson's strategy on some of these things is potentially a bit short-termist and a bit dangerous for him. I mean, he's, he's in quite some difficulty with his backbenchers on a number of issues. We know this on COVID, um, on other issues like the changes to the planning laws. There's quite a lot of things that there's some tension on in the House of Commons and the Lords will pick up on those things. Um, and try and kind of confront the government with whether they really want to overturn an amendment which um, backbenchers support. So you saw this on the internal on the um, internal market bill, and you also saw it on the trade bill on the issue of genocide. There was a lot of concern on the on the Commons backbenchers about genocide, and what Boris Johnson was asking people to do was to vote against their conscience on this issue. You know, you've got arm twisting by the whips and so on to defeat a Lord's Amendment, which ultimately he did succeed at. But I would question whether that's a wise strategy for a prime minister because it builds up resentment on your backbenches against you. And I think we've seen quite a lot of that. I mean, we've seen the, the chairman of the 1922 committee, Graham Brady, actually proposing an amendment on the coronavirus regulations. So that's pretty extraordinary. You know, these things would normally res be resolved behind the scenes. So there's lots and lots of examples going back over the years. Um, and on, 
during the Blair's years, one of the things that I, the, that I describe in my book is how there was this sort of tacit alliance between Labour backbenchers in the Commons and um, even Conservatives and Liberal Democrats in the Lords on identity cards, for example, where there were quite a lot of people in the Labour Party who didn't want identity cards to be introduced. Some thought it was contrary to uh, promises in the government manifesto. Blair was trying to push ahead with it, but there was collusion between backbenchers in the Commons and opposition forces in the Lords, and there were rebellions in the Lords, and in the end, essentially that policy got stopped. So it happens quite a lot, but it's it's not always visible. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Alistair, who's asking whether part of the problem for moderate reformers like Lord McFall um, is that small incremental changes like those that you, you were discussing make the House of Lords look better, more legitimate, but in doing so make any government opposition in the Lords harder for the government to dismiss? Exactly. That's exactly it. I mean, they do two things. Um, that's why I say, you know, I mean, I, I was led to believe that during the Cameron years, there was a stealth strategy of um, delegitimizing the Lords. I mean, I, 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 you know, there's no there's no explicit proof of that, but he put so many people in and there were so many negative headlines about how big it was getting and how absurd it was. The flack gets a, gets pointed at the Lords, not at the Prime Minister. And I think Boris Johnson will have watched and learnt from that. And maybe he's now uh, doing the same. So ironically, if the government treats the Lords badly, uh, the government wins. Um, mm. But the other thing that it does. So if so, if you have small reforms, yes, that does the opposite thing. Um, it makes the chamber look more legitimate, it therefore gives it more confidence, it makes it hard, harder for the government to say no to it, it makes it harder for the newspapers to run negative stories about it. But it also, and this is why uh, the, the reform groups tend not to embrace these kind of reforms, by making it look more legitimate, they fear that this makes large-scale reform less likely. <laughs> That if we think, oh, we, we can live with the House of Lords as it is, we've got a sort of fair appointment system. There's some proportionality built into it. The House, the, the Prime Minister can't pack it anymore. And actually, there are things about the Lords that are quite popular with the public. The fact it's got lots of independent members in there, the fact it's got these sort of great and good who are drawn from industry, that it's got former cabinet ministers from earlier eras, that it's got heads of the civil service and the, and the armed forces. People quite like all that. So if you legitimize it too much, you kind of weaken the case for large scale reform. So the reform pressure groups tend to resist small scale reform. But I say that again, that is a very high risk strategy mm. because if you just sit by and let it decline and get delegitimized, you are strengthening the government against parliament. You're allowing, as Lord McFall said, bad law to get passed more easily. And there is absolutely no guarantee that rising from the ashes will be your perfect House of Lords. Um, it's actually quite hard to see. It's a kind of scorched earth strategy and I think it's foolish. <laughs> so it's an interesting uh, take. Um, Nick Yates has asked uh, a kind of repeat question from one that he put to Lord McFall uh, about appointments. And he says the December appointments list says that Starmer nominated five peers. Um, is this correct? And if it is, how does this process actually work? Uh, well, bizarrely, um, the Prime Minister has absolute control over how many appointments are made, when they're made, and what the party balance is between them. So there are three sources, essentially, of appointments. There's the Prime Minister's own choices from his own party, and sometimes beyond his own party. There's the, the appointments that he offers to the opposition. So there is a convention which I think was part of um, somebody's question earlier. There is a convention that the Prime Minister doesn't meddle in the leader of the opposition's proposed appointments, uh, which goes back to Thatcher, I think. But we are in the land of conventions being broken now. And I'm not sure that Boris Johnson would feel uh, that he needed to stick to that convention. So, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm saying several things at once. So you've got the Prime Minister's own party, you've got the opposition parties where he decides how many to offer. He can offer them two, he can offer them 20. Nobody can do anything to affect that. Um, and then there's also the number that are offered to the Appointments Commission, which chooses a very small number of independent peers. The number being offered to the Appointments Commission has declined. The number being offered to the opposition has also declined. There's a com complicating factor here, which is Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Um, because I think that pr the 
the Prime Minister was probably reluctant to offer appointments to Jeremy Corbyn. And actually, there was some resistance on the Labour benches in the Lords to accept people appointed by Jeremy Corbyn, because there's a difference of opinion within the Labour Party. And then you've got the, the, the position where allegedly Jeremy Corbyn proposed John Burkow for one of the places that he'd been offered. And actually, that was turned down. So he's pushing at the conventions as well. And he's inviting the Prime Minister to start meddling by putting people up who kind of break the convention. So these conventions are slightly falling apart. Uh, some argue that there's a convention of balance between the parties. There isn't really. I mean, compared to Canada, uh, pre-reform, because the Canadian chamber has been reformed, in a, it's this wholly appointed chamber in, Ca in Canada. It's been reformed recently in very interesting ways so that all of the appointments are non-party now. This is quite a radical change brought about by uh, Justin Trudeau, which is really you know, kicking in now. Um, but the previous system in Canada was that the prime minister only appointed from their own party. We've certainly never had that, and that would be very bad. But we've not really had a convention of proper balance. We need some rules on how the balancing is done. We need some sort of link to general election votes or something like that, because what you see, and the, the Burns Committee is complaining about this now, is that We've had a Conservative-led gov government for 11 years. The Conservative benches are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The Labour benches are getting weaker and weaker. The Independent benches are getting weaker. And when Labour comes to power, if assuming it comes to power again, it's going to want to stack the Lords with a load of Labour people. I mean, it's just sort of instinctively sensible for it to want to do that. And then we're soon going to be up at a thousand members. So it, it's an unsustainable system. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, we've got another question from Sarah Jenkins um, about the efficacy of parliamentary scrutiny. And uh, Sarah asks, if Lords reform or the role of the Lords is challenging, Johnson's resistance to scrutiny and uh, Speaker Hoyle's uh, rebuke of the government this week is, is still fresh in the mind. Uh, I'm interested in Meg's view of what uh, or how effective scrutiny of Parliament has been during Gons Johnson's government. I think that's that's what you're trying to say, Sarah. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, well, it's been very difficult. I mean, we, we we have, it's a long time since we've had what I would refer to as normal politics. And, you know, to the extent that your pupils probably don't remember what I would consider normal politics, because, I mean, we, well, for, for, for those of us who are a bit older, normal politics kind of stopped in 2010 with the arrival of the coalition government. That was pretty weird. Um, and then we move on from the coalition government to Brexit, which was definitely very weird and very destabilising and caused a lot of nastiness in Parliament, not least because of the minority government, which was also a very unusual development. And Theresa May trying to get this massively controversial policy through a Parliament where her party was split and her party didn't even have a majority. And now we've got COVID, of course. So, you know, Johnson took over at the height of the Brexit controversy. Um, he was Prime Minister for one day before the summer recess in 2019. And before that recess was over, he'd uh, asked the Queen to prorogue Parliament for five weeks. So scrutiny wasn't going so great then. <laughs> he did his best uh, to avoid it over Brexit because he thought that Parliament was, the House of Commons was trying to stop Brexit. Um, and no sooner that Parliament was back after the failed prorogation attempt, he was trying to get a general election. Then we land in January, essentially, you know, general election, Christmas, January. I don't know whether there was a period of normality there, but very soon the place gets shut down due to COVID. And they've been trying to struggle with not only with two things, really. Um, one, uh, the fact that they're not there and they're interacting via Zoom and everything, which has totally changed the way that Parliament works, because so much of what goes on in Parliament, including the types of things I'm talking about, relies on informal conversations between people within parties. How many of us disagree with what he's doing on this? Are you going to vote against it? I might vote against it. You can imagine those conversations. And then conversations with the opposition that if you put, if you change your amendment to make it a bit less critical of the government, maybe there's about 30 of us on this side that will support you. Mm -hmm. Those conversations get more difficult and the conversations between the chambers get more difficult. Add to that the fact that the government is using emergency powers to introduce most of the COVID measures and not legislating on much else. And I would say parliamentary scrutiny has been pretty bad in the last, well, it's under Johnson, but not entirely not entirely due to Johnson's own making. 
but I think, yeah, he bears a significant part of the responsibility. And there is, if anybody's interested, uh, with three other external groups, we did a briefing, which again appears on our blog in April on how Parliament has been sidelined during COVID. Because uh, we've also seen proxy voting introduced in the House of Commons, uh, where the whips. Do anybody here know that um, at, at the height of COVID, over 600 votes in the House of Commons were being cast by party whips by about four people? It's astonishing. It, it barely even got any media coverage. So it's been a really bad time for Parliament, but they are fighting back. And um, when they come back, it's going to be very interesting to see what the relationship between Johnson and, and, and his own backbenchers is, because they're pretty fed up. Um, and I don't know whether he's going to be able to calm them down again or whether he's going to have a rather torrid time when Parliament physically returns. I'm very good at long answers. I'm sorry, James. Hey, we love the detail. Um, <laughs> uh, and that was a fantastic answer. Uh, as with every uh, report that, that Meg has mentioned, we've been popping links in the chat. So please scroll through the chat and click on them and have a read of, uh, of these different articles that, that Meg's been talking about. Um, so some worrying ideas uh, there about scrutiny and hopefully, hopefully things will go in a positive direction. Um, we've got time for one more uh, question and we're gonna take that from Jolene who um, is asking a great question. Uh, she would like to know whether Scotland should have a second tier. Mm. What do you think, Meg? That is a very interesting question and something, in fact, I was talking about with an SNP parliamentarian only yesterday. Um, I think it would be a very bad idea for the UK to go unicameral. Um, if you look around the world, um, most of the large developed democracies are bicameral. So, you know, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, um, obviously the US, a lot of the Americas, Japan, India, South Africa, you know, the, the second chambers in lots of places. But actually in small states, unicameralism is not uncommon. Um, so in the Nordic countries, for example, in New Zealand went from bicameral to unicameral. So if you've got a relatively cohesive citizenry and a small country, unicameralism becomes more defensible. But there is a discussion to be had, and some people have argued that there should be a second chamber in Scotland. Um, and I think that that argument will really get going if independence comes back on the agenda, because I think there will be some quite legitimate questions about whether if the government in Scotland has wider policy responsibility, there also needs to be additional scrutiny and the Scottish Parliament needs to be strengthened in some way and bicameralism would be one way. But of course, you'd be instantly into uh, the awful argument about what would the second chamber look like? I mean, you know, are they going to be appointed? Appointed by whom? Are they going to be, you know, re regionally elected on a different electoral system? It's already a proportional system for the lower house, so you're hardly going to introduce first past the post, I suspect, for the upper house. These questions of bicameral reform are very, very difficult, and they're unresolved in countries all over the world. So in Ireland, they had... Um, a referendum a few years ago on abolishing the Senate, which failed. Matteo Renzi um, in Italy lost his premiership through losing a referendum on bicameral reform. It's it's a quagmire. <laughs> uh, so good luck to them. <laughs> I can uh, I, I can sense a, a topic coming on for next year's PSA school uh, video competition. Uh, <laughs> I think that's where we that's where we need the bright ideas to come from. Well, thank you ever so much, Meg. That was a, a wonderful presentation and some really thorough answers in the Q&A as and well. And some great questions and excellent sharing. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Meg. <laughs> I think on behalf of, of the entire audience, uh, I'll thank you once again. And um, I realise you're very busy, so feel free to, to, uh, to leave us if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meg. Um, all right, so we've got um, about 10 minutes left. And what we wanted to do with the final 10 minutes was uh, give you a little bit more information about the Parliamentary Education Service and the PSA. Um, in case you'd be interested in getting more involved with either organisation and, and participating in more events like this that each organisation puts on. So I'm going to invite um, Rosie Gillen, who works at the Parliamentary Education Service, to join us and just tell you a little bit about um, PEARS, who they are and, and what they do and how you can get involved. Uh, thank you very much, James, and a uh, big thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, I think Meg's left now, but a big thank you to her as well. It's been really interesting to see and those talks and the questions coming through as well. So I'm a member of the education and engagement team uh, here at UK Parliament. Um, I work specifically on uh, teacher training opportunities. Uh, so something that we'd like to highlight today um, is a recently new initiative that we've launched, 
called our UK Parliament uh, Teacher Network. Uh, this is for teachers of um, all backgrounds and at all stages in their career. Um, an opportunity for you to stay in contact uh, with us and for us to stay in contact with you, uh, to offer you further training opportunities um, and send you resources that you can use in your classroom as well. So I'll be popping the link in the chat box for that. So please do sign up. It'd be wonderful uh, to see your names on the membership list. Um, and also we'd like to highlight our ECPD um, modules. So these are e-learning for teachers modules where you can go on our website, access these 24 seven, and they look at different aspects of parliament and how it works. If you complete those, then you'll receive a, a certificate of participation signed by the speaker of both houses. Um, so please do get involved. It'd be wonderful to see you again at further training opportunities. Uh, but at this point, I'm gonna hand back uh, over to James. Brilliant, thank you, Rosie. Um, and if you think, why well, I wanna join the Parliamentary Education Service, that's brilliant, but I'm looking for more, then please do consider the Political Studies Association as well. Um, we are the largest learning society for, for politics, academics, teachers, uh, and those in cognate subjects in the UK. We've been around since about 1950. Um, and as school teachers, you can sign up for school membership, which costs just £25 a year. Uh, and for £25, you can sign up um, as many teachers as you want from your school where you're teaching at the moment. Um, for that £25, you can access our members only online resource area where we cultivate resources that are matched to the A-level politics curriculum. Uh, and hopefully those are, are useful for you in the classroom. You can also access our seminars for schools program. So if you get in touch and say, look, I'm teaching this topic um, this term and I'd love an academic who specializes in that area to come in and speak to my students, then we can arrange that for you um, at no additional cost. Uh, you also get a subscription to our e-newsletter and access, uh, online access rather, to our academic journals. So your students and yourselves can be accessing the latest academic publications um, covering a, a wide range of topics and hopefully across uh, the whole of the, the curriculum you're teaching. Um, your students can also enter our competitions. So we have a video competition that we run with YouGov each year uh, and a blog competition that we run with the Financial Times. Uh, and th those are just a, a few of the benefits you can um, reap from, from being a PSA schools member. And if you have any questions um, at any time, feel free to contact me or uh, contact the PSA directly. Um, contact details will be posted in the chat for you. And we're always very happy to take questions and even more happy to receive suggestions for topics for these future webinars or, or any other uh, ideas for events that you'd like the PSA and PES to be covering. So unless there is uh, anything that uh, has been asked in the chat, I'll have a quick um, scan. I can't see anything pressing. Uh, I'd like to thank you all once again for giving up your time at the end of a long school day, especially in the summer term when it's so hot and uh, sunny outside to, to join us and to, to participate and engage with this event um, and I wish you all the best for the rest of this term um, and the summer break. Thank you very much.